Olivier Ollier, uh, thank you for joining. Welcome to the Business Spectator. Pleasure. Uh, look, let me start off with um, the, the idea of neuroeconomics. Could you, could you explain to us what exactly that entails? Simply put, it's uh, a mix of psychology, economics, and brain sciences. Mm -hmm. The idea being that for a long while, economics has considered the economic agent, this mm -hmm. very rational, selfish mm -hmm. um, person that is not influenced by her environment, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, the problem is that there are anomalies to these economic models. When you look at people, they behave in a fashion where mm -hmm. they're very emotional, that they have some psychological biases, loss aversion, mm -hmm. and things like that, mm -hmm. that uh, do not verify the standard economic models. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, uh, I think, a couple of decades now, some economists have been interacting with psychologists in, on the, in order to, to understand these kind of biases. And more recently, uh, people have been uh, getting more and more interest in those techniques that allow us to estimate how the brain functions mm. and to try to understand the role played by emotions in economic decisions mm. because for the first time maybe we have access to uh, new information regarding the underlying decision-making processes. And I guess uh, you, the, the GFC, the, the global financial crisis, must have provided a fertile ground for maybe uh, looking at some of the things that you have been studying. I have to admit that as uh, politically incorrect as my sta statement is going to be, um, well, th this crisis has been uh, the best advertisement for behavioral <laughs> and uh, neuroeconomics. Yes. Uh, because the problem today is not so much to say that thanks to behavioral and neuroeconomics mm. we're, we're going to find all the solutions, mm. uh, solve all the problems. Mm. But one thing is for sure is that so far everything that has been put up front in terms of standard economics mm. is, uh, has kind of failed. Mm. Uh, of course, you the, look at efficient market hypotheses and mm. things like that. The problem today will be more that Thanks to behavioral and neuroeconomics, we learn more, we know more about the individual, but how can we uh, move from the individual level to mm. the more aggregate level? And that's yeah. one of, I, I think, the, the, the caveat of, uh, of these approaches that mm. are centered around the human. Uh, we can observe things, uh, whether we're talking about interaction between neurons or between individuals on the market, mm. you know, patterns at the individual level mm. that you can observe also at the more collective one. Mm. But the problem would be how would you transfer from one level to another? Mm. And this is a common problem that uh, both neuroscientists on their side and economists mm. on their other side have been working on for uh, decades mm. and uh, we're trying to collaborate on that matter hence it's not just the purpose of understanding better the role of emotions mm. in decision making because uh, we can talk about that but we're not it's not such clear-cut as emotion and rationality by yeah. the way uh, it's really a mix of, of both uh, that uh, we like to call emo rationality because what the brain does is we do not have a, a kind of rational part mm. of the brain and a so-called emotional part we've got those two parts that are exchanging information continuously, yeah. continuously. Yeah. Hence, it's not possible to distinguish the way we would do when talking, make mm. those two boxes, motion, rationality. Well, uh, at the biological level, there is not so clear a uh, difference. So this is definitely something that uh, behavioral and brain sciences, and I insist on the behavioral part. Mm. We cannot re rely exclusively on brain sciences. We have to take into account the psychological uh, yeah. aspect, the role of, of the environment. Uh, as I like to, to tell my student, the brain on its own is a totally useless organ. You know, if, you, if, if the brain is not interacting with the body, with the environments, the brain doesn't, doesn't help. Studying mm. the brain doesn't help. But as much as it can help, if you consider the, the, the environment, there is still this problem of, uh, you know, going from one level of, of observation to another, mm. which makes it difficult today to uh, tell uh, to what extent behavioral and neuroeconomics can impact the global market. So far, the work that's been done, what has that shown with regard to how do we react when it comes to risk taking and managing risk? Managing risk is very interesting. Uh, my perspective on most MBAs is that uh, they're changing their curriculum uh, mm. at the moment, but a lot of them have relied upon 
learning by hot strategies. If mm. this happens, this is what you have to do. If this other thing happens, you have to apply another strategy. But what is going on in our world mm. with all these new risks that are emerging, these interdependent risks that are not in textbooks, that we mm. never heard about, mm. but that a lot of uh, risk management people have to deal with? Mm. How do we cope with that? And uh, I uh, attended uh, last year a very uh, fantastic conference called The Irrational Economist, <laughs> where basically a lot of stakeholders w from uh, academia, the government, etc. Mm. Uh, it was organized at Wharton School. Well, this conference brought together all these people, and the idea was how can we rethink risk management? And one of the key elements that came out is we definitely have to put the human, uh, uh, human decision making at the heart of everything. Mm. Meaning that we have to take into consideration that we have psychological biases, emotional mm. biases, and we need to use them when uh, we have to review our strategies. And uh, maybe if we can cope uh, in a more efficient fashion with our emotional reactions, mm. then we'll be more adaptive to these new strategies uh, to develop or new risks that we have to face. I mean, when it comes to financial markets, though, or ju just the history of financial markets, are we in some ways sort of geared to, to play that game of rise and fall? I, I wouldn't go so far as talking that uh, we are wired or we have uh, any uh, pre-whatever yeah. that uh, would... Uh, push us in one direction. Mm. The one thing uh, that we can say at the moment is that on the markets, uh, there are uh, psychological biases that are redundant. Mm. The aversion to loss, the overconfidence. Mm. Overconfidence, I think, is one of the killing things uh, mm. on a trading floor. But also, uh, information contagion. It's interesting, some of the work I've been doing with my colleagues is about how um, gesture, uh, emotions, physical uh, mm. appearance and movements influence the way we decide, which is something very unusual in economics mm. because the economic agent doesn't have a body, yeah. it's totally disembodied. Yeah. Uh, we recently uh, published some work called Embodied Economics. Why? Because let's uh, think about what is happening on trading floor, mm. uh, open space. You've got all these people sitting next to each other and one is getting extremely nervous at the extreme right. The person next to, to this uh, trader looks at the, the trader and gets nervous as well, wondering mm -hmm. what's going on and so on. And you've got emotional contagion, just the same way you've got some kind of informational uh, contagion uh, in terms of gossiping mm. rumors yeah. that can definitely flip a market upside mm. down. So all these elements are not included in all these kind of macro models mm. of financial markets but they can play a key role. And uh, to be honest, at the moment, we're working very hard on understanding emotional contagion, informational mm. contagion on the market to understand whether, um, thanks to these new tools we have, which are not uh, brain scanners, because you don't, if you put people in brain scanners, they are not in their <laughs> natural environment, but some uh, beautiful work from people in Cambridge University have shown us that you can measure the, the hormonal reaction of traders, and you can even predict some traders' performance based on the, the testosterone level uh, to a certain range, it's not. Uh, uh, now, Olivia, do you think, uh, just, just in summation, um, the work that you're doing, are you confident that this has the, uh, the potential to become a day of everyday market parlance within the next decade or so? I think so, because there is a definite need for new measures. New risk, new uh, environment call for new measures. And this is why uh, the French, the Premier Minister of uh, France, our French Prime Minister, sorry, uh, has launched this uh, neuroscience and public policy program mm. to find out how we can transfer this lab, this newly found knowledge on brain behavioral and brain sciences mm. uh, from the labs to a public policy. And it starts with uh, finance and uh, economics and uh, the more, most recent work we, we have is uh, a report on the implications our findings have on public health prevention. We have a, a big report that can be downloaded for free. Okay. Olivier, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. Love to meet you.